Turn to Exodus 20. This morning we're starting a new sermon series through the Ten Commandments, which are actually found in two places in the Old Testament, here in Exodus 20, which is where we'll be, but then also in Deuteronomy 5, where they're repeated. Uh, In Scripture, they're literally called the Ten Words, or the Decalogue in Greek, but since these verses primarily communicate what God expects of his people, the Ten Commandments is the title that has stuck and what they're popularly known as today. With the possible exception of Genesis 1 and 2 or Psalm 23, the Ten Commandments surely are the most well-known part of the Old Testament. Even with increased secularization, most people in our culture would be familiar with them, or at least those over 50. However, it's one thing to know about the Ten Commandments, and quite another to know what they are, and know them by heart, as most people did not long ago in our Western society. But it seems very few do today. According to a recent poll, while 78% of respondents were in favor of public displays of the Ten Commandments in schools, courtrooms, and government buildings, only 14% could actually name all ten, while 60% couldn't name even five. In comparison, 74% could name all of the three stooges. Could you do that? (laughs) Uh, 35% of respondents could recall all six children of the TV show The Brady Bunch. And 25% could recall all seven ingredients of the McDonald's Big Mac. Clearly, the Ten Commandments are not well known today like they once were in the West, when when teachers would have them in their classrooms, churches would recite them on Sunday mornings, and children would learn them at home through Christian catechesis. But more concerning is how the Ten Commandments are also not obeyed today. Though they may be respected by many, they don't seem to be very relevant to most. Just pay attention and you will see every commandment broken in every possible way. Over three decades ago, James Patterson and Peter Kim carried out a national survey on morality in America and discovered that there really is no absolute moral consensus, despite what people say. Rather, everyone basically makes up their own moral code. So based on their findings, they revealed the 10 real commandments people live by, which included, I don't see the point in observing the Sabbath, 77% agreed with that. I will steal from those who won't really miss it. 74% agreed with that. I will lie when it suits me. 64%. I will cheat on my spouse. After all, given the chance he or she would do the same. 53%. And I will procrastinate at work and do absolutely nothing about one full day of every five. It's just standard operating procedure. 50%. Now, can you just imagine what they would find today Three decades later, as America and Canada, for that matter, has become even more morally relativistic. As theologian and cultural commentator Al Mohler observes in his book on the Ten Commandments, to live in this day is to live in an antinomian age, an age that is against all law. Western society is addicted to minimal law and maximum flexibility. Now, I'm sure none of this is new to you, it's rather obvious, but as we start this series, I think we do need to be candid and clear about the state of our society, and for that matter, of the church. It's easy to point out the terrible neglect of the Ten Commandments out there, but what about the far more tragic neglect of the Ten Commandments in here? If we look back at our roots as evangelical Protestants, Every group of churches included an exposition of the Ten Commandments in their foundational documents, and specifically in the catechisms they used for teaching the Christian faith through questions and answers. And so for centuries, uh, Lutheran, Reformed, Anglicans, Presbyterians, Anabaptists, Baptists, they all expected and they all ensured that children and new converts would at the very least have memorized the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments. But how many evangelical Protestant churches are doing that today? 
Not many. Rather, over the past century or so, it seems that doctrinal instruction has been replaced by devotional inspiration. And therefore, the Ten Commandments, and for that matter, all these other helpful historical summaries of biblical Christianity are unknown by many and unmemorized by most. How many of you could recite all Ten Commandments if I randomly chose you to come up here and do so? Have you put the Ten Commandments to memory? And even more to the point, are you obeying them in life? Or do you not see their relevance for life today? Some argue that because they are found in the Old Testament and connected to the Old Covenant with Israel, the Ten Commandments have no real authority over Christians or the church today, since we are under the New Covenant and called to obey the law of Christ rather than the law of Moses Uh, In that vein, one popular megachurch pastor uh, preached a viral sermon a few years ago where he urged Christianity today to be unhitched from the Old Testament. He then, in a book, doubled down later, asserting, quote, the Ten Commandments have no authority over you, none. To be clear, thou shalt not obey the Ten Commandments. Maybe you've heard something like that before and therefore dismissed the Decalogue, thinking it has no place in this age of grace. It was just for those Old Testament saints back then. Or maybe you just think they're too old-fashioned. They're out of date. They're, They're overly restrictive for today. Certainly not something we should emphasize if we want to reach liberated 21st century people. Well, as we now begin to look at these laws together, starting today in Exodus 20, 1 to 2, we will discover that they are, in fact, relevant and regulative for Christians today. The prologue of this passage, or the introductory words, indicating that God's people in every age must know and keep the Ten Commandments. First of all, because they are the permanent revelation of God. So, chapter 20, verse 1, begins like this, And God spoke all these words. Now, every nation in history has had laws that shape and regulate individual and national life. And the Old Testament nation of Israel, to whom these were originally given, was no exception. However, unlike every other nation, Israel did not create their constitutional or case laws, but rather they received them directly from God. He spoke all these words to them around 3,500 years ago, accompanied with thunder and lightning and trumpet sounds and smoke, as we read later in verse 18. This this audio-visual event, unlike any other, demonstrating that something very special was taking place as they were revealed. As ancient kings would make treaties or covenants with with nations that they would rule over, stipulating what those nations must do in order to fully benefit from their protection and care, so the king of kings was making a covenant with the nation of Israel at Sinai. And it's recorded for us from Exodus 20 all the way to chapter 31, but it begins here with the Ten Commandments. Like a national constitution today, these 10 words from God clearly established the foundation of their national life and were the basis of all of the laws that followed. There were 613 specific laws given to Israel in the Old Testament, but these 10 laws sum them up. Well, of course, Jesus sums them up even further with two commands, to love God and love your neighbor pointing to the the arrangement of the Decalogue, what's often called the two tables of the law. Uh, The first four commandments speaking about our duty to God, and then commandment five to ten about our duty to others. Some think these were also divided on the, the two tablets of stone that God wrote later on in the book, as we see in chapter 31, 18. Uh, But more likely, these were two identical copies of the law, uh, one for the king and one for the nation. This was just common covenantal procedure at the time. And I love how it says later in Exodus 31 that God wrote them with his finger on the stone, a, a powerful picture of their authority. Now, though many today would think that the Ten Commandments are terribly restrictive, it's it's helpful to note that even once you add up the 600 plus additional case laws, that's really few. 
compared to the endless laws of many ancient and especially modern societies. So, for example, in Canada, there's currently a bill being proposed called the Online Harms Bill, which would impose responsibilities on online platforms and social media services, and maybe you've heard about this, uh, to protect children and vulnerable, vulnerable people from, from harmful content. Now, since it has some potentially troubling implications for religious expression, I checked it out a few weeks ago, and it is 40 pages long in very small print. That's just one bill to amend the criminal code, filled with all kinds of legal jargon that no ordinary person could possibly understand. Meanwhile, God gave his people these 10 short and simple commandments as the basis of their life. That's not overly restrictive. That's liberating. <laughs> That's merciful. That's sensible. That's wise. Now, of course, the 10 commandments are not exhaustive even in the areas they address, but they are what theologians would call paradigmatic. That is, they're, they're models of behavior or uh, guiding principles that are meant to be obeyed particularly in what they say, but also then applied generally to similar situations. So, for example, uh, the negative prohibition, do not murder, also implies the positive responsibility to protect and promote life. Right? And it's that sort of thing that was common in ancient laws. Well, in modern law, we tend to opt for exhaustive law codes where every prohibited action must be specifically mentioned in a separate law. And that leads to all of the, the technicalities and loopholes that we see people getting away with. Clearly, God's way is much wiser. How thankful we should be for 10 commandments, which are, in the end are the, are the basis for the many millions of laws in our nation anyway. As someone figured out, we have 35 million laws trying to enforce 10 commandments. Now, as I mentioned earlier, some Christians today will say that's actually a mistake, uh, that the 10 commandments were never meant to be a permanent basis of morality for individuals or nations except Israel, since they're part of the old covenant. But I think that's mistaken as do the majority of Christians in church history. Uh, there are many reasons why they are in fact still relevant and in some way regulative for us today. Uh, an unchanging summary of what God requires of his people in every age. The first reason is their unique communication. So as we see here in verse 1 and then later in verse 19, unlike any other rev revelation to his people, God spoke the Ten Commandments directly to Israel demonstrating their distinctiveness. And then later, he etched them into stone with his own finger to show also their durableness, then ordering the two tablets to be placed uniquely in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ten Commandments were also intentionally repeated in Deuteronomy 5 with the added note, the Lord spoke to all your assembly and he added no more, signifying that these ten words were sufficient for holiness, and we're at the heart of all of Israel's obligations to God. In these ways, they were elevated above all these other laws, showing they were special, and we would therefore conclude lasting for all times. But there's more. Also note their unique character. You know, laws always reveal something about those who made them. So, for example, laws against speeding and distracted driving show that a society values public safety. Uh, or laws that govern uh, handicap access to public buildings show a society values inclusiveness. Well, in the same way, God's laws reveal his character, especially the Ten Commandments. Because unlike the temporary civil laws that govern the theocracy of Israel for a time, and the ceremonial laws that prescribe the sacrificial system that was foreshadowing Christ, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, are moral law that reflect the unchanging righteousness that is inherent to God himself. And so while Christians no longer stone disobedient children or offer animal sacrifices, Idolatry, blasphemy, murder, adultery, stealing, etc. They are still wrong and always will be. As Philip Ryken concludes, do the Ten Commandments have any abiding relevance for Christians and the culture which we live? 
Once we understand the relationship between our Lord and his law, this question is easy to answer. Yes, God's law is still binding today. His standard hasn't changed any more than his character has changed. Which takes us to the final reason that the Ten Commandments are still relevant today, and it is their unique continuity. You know, most of these laws actually showed up in the Old Testament before Exodus 20, either explicitly or implicitly. And when we get to the New Testament, they remain. We find that the commandments are not rejected, but repeated by Christ and the apostles. They're endorsed, they're explained, and they are expanded in places like Mark 19, Romans 13, Ephesians 6, 1 Timothy 1, James 2. So clearly the Ten Commandments, in a sense that they are moral law, tied to the character of God, are still the basis of ethics for New Covenant believers. As early church father Irenaeus wrote in the second century, preparing man for this life, the Lord himself did speak the words of the Decalogue in his own person to all alike. Therefore, in like manner, do these commandments remain permanently with us. Because of Christ's advent in the flesh, they have received extension and increase, but not abrogation. So the Ten Commandments, God's people, we are still to know them and keep them. Because, first and foremost, they are the permanent revelation of God. But there's more. Secondly, we also see this is true because of our personal relationship with God. So we read on in Exodus 20, verse 2. This is what God said. I am the Lord your God. So the first thing God wanted the people of Israel to remember is who he is. Not just a lowercase God amongst all the other so-called gods of the nations, but the Lord. In Hebrew, Yahweh. The name that was revealed to Moses earlier, before the Exodus had, had occurred. So in Exodus 3, 13 to 15, this famous account, we read this. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. So in this encounter, the God of Israel reveals himself as the one true, eternal, self-existent God. The very one we meet right at the beginning of our Bibles, before the creation of anyone or anything, right? In the beginning, God. This is the one who gave the Ten Commandments, our creator, which means he has absolute authority to rule and regulate our lives, to tell his creatures what we must do and what we must not do according to his will. And he expects obedience. Yeah, let's be honest. How often do we make excuses? How often do we give exceptions to ourselves as if somehow, you know, this rule doesn't apply to me? As the Lord, as if the Lord doesn't have the right to rule over our lives. But obedience we see here is not an option. It's an obligation for every man, woman, and child whom God created. Uh, he made us, and therefore he and he alone has the right to make the rules. As many years ago, news anchor Ted Koppel famously said at a commencement speech at Duke University, what Moses brought down from Mount Sinai were not ten suggestions. They are commandments. However, notice also how these commandments were given by the Lord. We see clearly they were given in the context of, of a personal relationship. God reminding Israel, and not just Israel as a whole, but he uses the singular later, you, that he says, I am the Lord, your God. Referring to the covenant that he made with Abraham and his descendants, just like we saw earlier in Exodus 3.15, if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now he was also making it a new way with the nation of Israel as a whole here. So we look back at chapter 19, verses 4 to 6. 
He says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So ultimately, the Ten Commandments were given to Israel so that they would enjoy their special relationship they had with the Lord, who had chose them and who loved them and who wanted what was best for them. That is so important for us to recognize. Deuteronomy 6.24, after giving the Ten Commandments there in chapter 5, we read, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always. He didn't give them to harm Israel, but to help Israel. He didn't give the Ten Commandments to to keep them from some good, but to keep them from bad things. He didn't give them the Ten Commandments as a burden, but as a blessing. And this is also true for the church today. Since in Christ, we too have become in him the children of God. We have been born again. We've been given new spiritual life so that we can not only know the commandments, but actually freely keep them. 1 John 5 says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Did you catch that? They're not burdensome. They're for our good, whether we feel like it or whether we can see it or not. Is it not such a great privilege to be the children of such a loving heavenly father who would give us new life, who in Christ would cause us to be born again, adopted into his family, children of God, and then say, and this is the way to live for your good, for your blessing. Not by your fallible whims and wisdom that gets you into so much trouble, but rather according to my infallible word. An interviewer once asked a crowd, what do you think of the Ten Commandments? One person just stared at the questioner and gasped, are you kidding? Another laughed and said with a grin, I think rules were made to be broken. Well, another announced, well, I'm just glad we don't have to keep those anymore. But then one more woman asked, what do I think of the Ten Commandments? And after pausing and pondering it for a moment, she said, well, I think God must love us an awful lot to give them to us, to protect us from ourselves. I hope that you can say that. I hope you believe that. I hope you're acting in such a way that you truly trust that God has given us his laws, not to harm us, but to help us. Not to keep something good from us, but to keep us from evil. Not as a burden, but as a blessing. As the Apostle James writes in James 1.25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Why should God's people in all ages know and keep the Ten Commandments? Because of our personal relationship with God, a God who loves us and wants what's best for us. But there's one final reason we see here, and it's really the most important. It is also because we have been purposely, purposefully redeemed by God. So again, verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. As we study the Ten Commandments, it is absolutely critical we understand that the law comes after liberation, that God's demands follow God's deliverance, that he only tells us what we must do after telling us what he's already done for us. Exodus 1 to 19 was all about how the Lord mercifully rescued his people from slavery 
And only after establishing that fact does he now give them his law in Exodus 20 to 31. It's not the other way around. Don't miss this. So critical. You're going to get the Ten Commandments all wrong if you miss this. It is good news first and good works second. Emphasizing what we see both in the Old and New Testament, that we obey God as a response to his grace. That we receive the Ten Commandments as those who have already been redeemed and the only one who ever kept them perfectly for us. We know and keep his law not to earn his forgiveness and favor, but rather to fully enjoy the forgiveness and favor that is already ours in Christ. It's what we see later in Deuteronomy 7, 8 to 9, where Moses reminds the people, but it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who then love him and keep his commandments. Do you see how, how God's law and God's liberation come before his law? And we'll see this also in the New Testament, where Christ and the apostles make this even more explicit. For example, in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you see that, church? It's always grace and gospel before good works. It's, it's liberty before law. We are not saved by obedience to the law. We are saved for obedience to the law. I love how uh, Kevin DeYoung describes this dynamic in his book on the Ten Commandments. He writes, God did not come to the people as slaves and say, I have ten commandments. I want you to get these right. I'm going to come back in five years, and if you've gotten your life cleaned up, then I'll set you free from Egypt. That's how some people view Christianity. God has rules, and if I follow the rules, God will love me and save me. That's not what happened in the story of the Exodus. The Israelites were an oppressed people, and God said, I hear your cry. I will save you because I love you. And when you are saved, free, and forgiven, then I'm going to give you a new way to live. We need to hear it again. Salvation is not the reward for obedience. Salvation is the reason for obedience. All our doing is only because of what he has first done for us. And I hope we know just how good news that is. Because if obedience to the law was how we somehow earned God's love, we would all be in big trouble. Since we all disobeyed God in thought, word, and deeds. We all do things we should not do and especially leave undone things we are commanded to do. We all fail to keep the commandments every day and it therefore would only condemn us. But praise God, he loved us first. He sent Jesus to save us from the sin and condemnation that the law, like a mirror, exposes in us and then gives us new spiritual life through faith in him so we are able to freely obey as the redeemed in gratitude and grace. I love how theologian J.I. Packer sums this up. He says, law-keeping is that life for which we were fitted by nature, unfitted by sin, and refitted by grace, by the gospel of Jesus Christ who sets us free. So why should God's people in every age know and keep the Ten Commandments? It's because it is the permanent revelation of God. It's because of our permanent, or our, our personal, sorry, relationship with God, a God who loves us and who's given them to us for our good. 
And finally, and most importantly, it's because we have been purposefully redeemed by God for this very thing. Three reasons that I want to encourage you to keep in mind as we go through this study so that we understand clearly what they're about. But as I wrap up this introductory sermon, uh, I also want to just, in closing, encourage you to do three more things through this study. First is this, really simple, learn the Ten Commandments. Decide today that you are going to put them to memory and that you're going to meditate on them regularly. So among other things, you could name them all if I randomly chose you to come up here, which I might do. (laughs) So... But likewise, parents, especially, listen, parents, parents, resolve today to ensure that your children know them by heart so that the next generation will not be ignorant of what so many are today. Brian Edwards, in his book, Ten Commandments for Today, um, just gives a, a real powerful summary of why this is important. I know I've been quoting a lot of people today, but it's just good stuff. What is wrong with this generation is that we're dealing with children who are the third generation to be brought up in almost total ignorance to the rules that their creator has given them and the personal implication of these rules. Put another way, society is doing what it's always been doing since the tragedy of the Garden of Eden. It's listening to the wrong voice. Today we have a morality defined by consensus and experiment. Right and wrong is what the majority wants, or more generally, what the most vocal minority wants. Only when we are prepared to teach our children absolutes and to model those absolutes with our own lives will there be any arrest of the downward spiral of moral decline. There's almost a total loss of respect in our society. We have no respect for authority, for leadership, for women, for laws, for property. Just about the only respect left is for animals and trees. But the Ten Commandments insist upon respect for God, for parents, for life, for marriage, for property, and for truth. Therefore, few things are more important today than a return to understanding and teaching them. Learn the Ten Commandments and parents, teach them, teach your children And if you want a resource, we have our Christian Catechism for Family Worship, and it it includes memorizing the Ten Commandments as well as the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. And and actually, right now, Darla is, is just finishing editing it, so it looks a little bit nicer. We'll have those available. Learn the Ten Commandments. Uh, Second, live the Ten Commandments. Should go without saying, but let me say it again. As we're studying the Ten Commandments, live them out. Decide today that you are going to put into practice what we're learning, not just admiring them, but acting upon them. And I would ask you, as we go through this study, to be praying before you come to worship every Sunday, Lord, soften my heart that I am willing to be corrected and convicted and to make the changes necessary in my life. Listen, if this is just going to be a mental exercise for you, it's going to be a complete waste of time. God has revealed his moral law to us so that we might live moral lives unto him. A businessman whose unethical practices were widely known once told Mark Twain of the pilgrimage that he hoped to be making soon, saying, before I die, I plan to climb Mount Sinai and read the Ten Commandments out loud on top. To which Twain responded, I have a better idea. How about you stay at home and obey them? (laughs) Learn the Ten Commandments through this series. Live the Ten Commandments. And thirdly and finally, love the Ten Commandments. Decide today that you are going to cherish the great gift that God our Father has given us. A simple summary of his moral law that's easy to memorize so that by the Holy Spirit we can readily put them into practice in our lives, for our good, for the good of others, and ultimately for the glory of God. And you know, the best way to do that, the best way to grow in our our delight in God's law is to daily remember our great deliverance. To remember that we are the redeemed. To remember the cost 
of Christ to set us free from the penalty and the power of sin so that we could now follow him in righteousness. Like John Newton, author of Amazing Grace, who every day when he'd wake up would say to himself, remember thou was a bondman in Egypt and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Remember the gospel. Remember who you are in Christ. Remember that he loved you first and he has set you free from the penalty and power of sin so that in in joy and freedom and gratitude, you'd want to follow him and experience more of that law he's given us because he loves us and wants what's best for us. Or King David, who also knew the, the height and the depths of God's grace, said in the Psalms, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. As we go through this series, let us pray for such love. Love for God, our redeeming Father. And love for the law that he's given us for our good. So that we will learn them and live by them together. Let's pray. Our great God and Father, we thank you again for the privilege that in Jesus Christ, your Son, we can call you Father, that we are the children of God, born again by faith in him, and that through that new life, we have now the ability to follow you, to keep your commands, to live holy lives. I pray, God, that uh, this series would be part of that, and that through the preaching of the Ten Commandments, you would sanctify us. Lord, I pray that you would soften our hearts and where we need to be corrected and convicted by your law, we would receive that and we would then joyfully and freely make the changes we need by the power of your spirit so that we can enjoy the blessing of following your word, following your good way. And again, we know, Lord, We know that this is not a burden because in Christ we've received every blessing in the spiritual places, the heavenly realms. And therefore, through Christ, we can grow. We can change. And we can rest in his forgiveness. We pray this all in his name. Amen.